Well, uh, good morning from London. Uh, welcome to today's session. Uh, we'll be talking about Malaysia's um, economic transition um, with Henry Tillman, uh, the founder and editor of China Investment Research um, and of Grison's Peak Services. Um, and Henry has um, been here before with us to talk about um, his, his research uh, into Asian economies, uh, but today the focus is really on Malaysia. Um, you, you'll probably know me, um, I'm Mike Wardle, I'm the Chief Executive Officer at ZN, um, and I'll be chairing today's session. Um, and just want to say um, a brief word of thanks um, to our sponsors. Um, we have a number of sponsors who allow us to range far and wide across the fields of the economy, uh, finance, technology, innovation, um, and we are really grateful for their support um, and for letting us uh, put on this series of, of webinars. Um, moving to today's session, uh, the program is um, there on the screen for you. Very much my role is to get out of the way um, quickly um, and allow uh, the session to move on to the keynote presentation from Henry. Um, but just a few housekeeping notes before we do that. Uh, first of all, the session is being recorded um, so that if you um, want to come back and uh, look at it again or uh, pick up on some of the detail, or indeed if you want to um, you know, tell your friends and colleagues about it, uh, the recording will be up online on our events page um, in around 48 hours. Um, secondly, there's a Q&A session um, after Henry's presentation. Um, if you haven't used GoToWebinar before, you can ask questions by going to the uh, questions tab on the dashboard. Uh, you'll see to the side of the screen, type your questions in and I'll be fielding those uh, to Henry during the Q&A session. Um, so to move on to um, interruptions really, um, Henry has been active um, in researching um, what's happening in the economies and particularly in terms of um, investments uh, moving in and outbound um, across Asia uh, for, for some while. A real expert and it's a real pleasure uh, to introduce Henry once again, this time uh, to focus on Malaysia. Um, and Henry, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mike. It's always nice to work with you guys. And the, this, the presentation is divided into a few slides on what uh, Malaysia has been in the last few years, as many of you would know, uh, how it's transitioning, as you see in the, and, and uh, all the movements they've made in terms of attracting international investment globally, and a little bit at the end of how they've been a real friend, including most recently to the UK. So at the high level, the, 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 the basic message is, you would know, uh, for those that follow Malaysia, this is a, a country which is, known for plantations of palm oil, and therefore it wouldn't surprise you that only 2% of their energy is not is, uh, is new energy or a renewable energy. And they're going to move that from 2% in 2022 to 20% by 2025, which is pretty quick movement. And also with some movement on digitization. Next slide, please. Well, can't you do some of these early slides? You can have this for yourself to look at. This basically shows uh, they had the they had they had been declining flows of inbound FDI for the uh, three prior years. It jumped in 2021. It'll be even higher in 2022. So it's come back as the world has recognized Malaysia, which will be a, a theme throughout these these slides. Next slide, please. I thought this was interesting. So if you if you look at the first four years of 17 to 20. You'll see services, financials, healthcare, manufacturing, and you'll see uh, you know, a, a lead by region of Asia. Now look at 2021. Manufacturing, we'll get into this a little bit later, and led by semiconductors. And by funding, you'll see Americas and Europe are not 50% of the funding. Um, and that was the case in 2018, but that's the only time it has been that case. So again, the theme throughout this is the world is discovering Malaysia, various different components of Malaysia, which they hadn't seen before. Next slide, please. Uh, consistent with what you've seen before, these were M&A flows. Uh, the flows, it was, uh, there was one major transaction in 2021, but the flows have come back very strong in 2021, 22, which you'll see in the next few pages. Next slide, please. Now we get to the history. So those of you that have followed Malaysia for a number of years and say, you know, I'm sure you, you know it so well, you look at the flows, plantations and real estate and domestic. You look at, look throughout 2020, 
part of this is driven, as you would recognize, by the fact you couldn't travel around Asia during the time, so most of it's domestic. Although there was one one, one thing new, I suppose, with Hong Kong bringing uh, an, an educational uh, holding into uh, one international transaction. But again, most of this in 2020, real estate, local, property, and consumer, and really one financial, financial market. Again, domestic mergers, we're leading this. Next slide, please. 2021, 22, again, domestic, and you can see what's what's leading it, except for the telecoms merger, which is 12 billion. Uh, the rest of these, again, are financials uh, or real estate or palm oil. Again, this is the snapshot people think of when they think of uh, historically of of of, uh, of Malaysia. Now, so an investor in Malaysia would look at these are these are cash flow businesses. These are non-growth businesses. These are low beta businesses, low for low beta investors. And therefore, you can imagine what challenges are occurring, are occurring in converting these uh, these type of investors that are used to certain things for many, many years into growth economies and growth stocks and venture capital, which we come on to later in this, in this document. Next slide, please. But in 2021, it starts opening up. Right? Everybody will know this. There was a change of leadership in this period of time. There's a change of leadership this year. Um, and there was not much happening as you saw from 2020 before. But look at how this began to open up in, in, in 2021. We, we find this quite interesting. And again, you'll see it's Asia investing, but you'll also see a bit of Europe. And you'll see the USA starting to become visible. And you'll see it's across across industries. So you'll see financial services, one of the first areas. So these insurance transactions were two of the biggest represented, the two of the largest insurers passing control from Malaysian ownership to foreign ownership. These are very big deals marketed globally um, and um, won by very large companies. Then if you look at you look at technology, you see the drones, AI, Aerodyne's one of the four drone manufacturers, well, sorry, one of the four companies in the world that have LiDAR technology to monitor um, um, these large wind farms around the world. Aerodyne down the road will become a, a unicorn, which I'll talk about a bit later, again, from an investment from Japan. Uh, Indian to FinTech, Korea and to FinTech, I think, um, Again, so it really was financial and I sure Bitcoin, you see there. Uh, again, financials were one of the first moves in 2021 and a little bit of focus on, on the new energy. Next slide, please. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, thank you very much. Sorry, I got lost in this. Um, I thought it's interesting to show outbound as well. So I, I put this in the in the document for you to see. Not only is the inbound flow, but also outbound flow. So, um, and we found this quite interesting. So if you look at the uh, the the, uh, the acquirers on the right hand side, with the um, the Malaysian based acquirers on on the right hand side, and where they're investing elsewhere in the world, you see one UK investment in renewables. That's that's offshore wind, which we'll come on to a bit later. You see e-commerce in Australia and Thailand. Again, you see a move towards technology. All that. So two years, this thing two years ago was all about domestic consolidation, for, uh, real estate, palm oil, and look how this is moving now. Albeit much later than some of the other countries in Asia to embrace to what renewables and uh, and e-commerce. Uh, okay, next slide, please. Um. And here's 2022 continuing on. Now this gets really interesting. This begins to to uh, you see the first movement towards um, this energy. We we'll talk about it a bit later, but but fundamentally, um, Malaysia wants to be a leading player in um, algae to biofuels, and it's a great place to grow algae, and they have the technology to do this. We're involved in a in one um, taking Malaysian technology and building a large set of algae um, plants in uh, in Saudi. So the first one of these is Shangxi Construction was announced at the end of, of, of 2021, actually, last year, or 
again, the biggest one was announced, uh, the follow-up was announced this summer. That's interesting. Uh, the packaging plant we think is interesting because that basically says that's a green, that's the green, if, if you will, green energy packaging. It's a leader in UAE, it's a leader in North Africa, and it's now committed to spend, uh, to build 10 green packaging plants over the next 10 years throughout, throughout Malaysia. And of course, you see India investing in FinTech. So again, you see uh, new energy, sorry, with algae to biofuels, you see green packaging, but you also see, again, uh, investments from China, UA, India. So it's attracting a lot of capital from other parts of the world to be, participate in this transition. Next slide, please. Continuing the theme, yeah, these are the, here, here are outbound transactions from the various players within within Malaysia and where they're investing. So while they're that while they're not investing in real estate in their home country, look where they're going internationally. You see real estate internationally, certainly UK real estate, UK renewables, and again it mirrors what they're doing internally, moving from a real estate into various different technologies or various new forms of energy. Yes, in particular, um, wind, offshore wind, um, that's Tanaga's offshore wind, and healthcare, and um, if you will, and but the I think the recipients of this are mostly Asia. You see Vietnam, China, Singapore, there's a couple in Sweden and the UK. Sweden's a big chemical steel, Don Petronas. Um, again, Singapore, Australia, Malaysia, Indonesia. So the flows are primarily on outbound from Malaysia into Asia, but you'll see the flows inbound are not necessarily led by Asia, but actually shifting to other parts of the world. All right, next slide, please. Uh, this, uh, we, have, we have some examples of PE. Uh, the PE in, in, um, in Malaysia is relatively undeveloped, underdeveloped relative to its peers. Uh, you can see where you can see the industries where it's attracting attention. Car sharing, that's new tech, 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 infrastructure, and tech. So they are they are moving, even though they're behind their peers, certainly uh, from an India, from an Indonesia, from a Singapore, Vietnam perspective, but this is actually quite attractive to other investors that are not uh, comfortable competing in those advanced venture capital PE markets in those other Asian countries. And therefore, you see many of the countries investing in this. Again, you see Asia mostly leading, uh, with the exception of the USA, in, in transportation uh, through Air Asia Group. Uh, but the rest of these are all uh, Asia plays, including Taiwan. And I think the other thing I want to highlight here is, is basically there was a perception that China really dominated the um, the internal flows into into Malaysia, probably through 2018, 2019, China's the, sorry, Malaysia has done a fantastic job, just like we saw in Bangladesh, of balancing inbound flows from various continents of the world uh, and looking and, and man managing those inbound flows. But again, to highlight again on this page, which you saw on the previous page, ADIA from UAE, uh, we're seeing another trend we're seeing here, we saw before pack on the last page that in the past year we've seen the UAE both UAE but uh, the Gulf both UAE and Saudi become uh, very active investors across this region our next one of these we do is in Indonesia and Saudi has been very active in, in Indonesia UAE less so I um, and we're also looking at Thailand later this year and we know I've I, I met with the chairman of the central bank of Thailand in September and, and Saudi had already made five five investments already this, to date this year in, in Thailand. The reason I raise this is, is this huge misperception that China's are going around buying everything, which is actually not true because on a, on a run rate basis this year, China outbounds about 40 billion in M&A and equity capital and equity, private equity investments versus 255 billion in 2016. So you see it's down 85% where Saudi might spend 55 billion on a weekend. So this whole perception that self and be all being dwarfed by by China, you don't see many many Chinese invest numbers here on these on these pages. You see some UAE and you'll see more 
Saudi in the next in the next year. Next slide, please. The same is true here. I would like to I like to highlight um, again healthcare, banking. This is this is in, in digital banking. I'll come on to a second here. Consumer finance and and Luxembourg is CBC is really a Luxembourg company, but it's a U.S. a U.S. private equity firm. So again, USA has done a good job of picking up the investment here. We'll come on to it a bit later. Uh, and again, Singapore, Malaysia, Asia, and USA in, in the in the PE space. So I'll take a minute here. I didn't highlight. I did not make a page on venture capital, and I didn't because they are behind, uh, substantially behind on venture capital, uh, and um, they recognize that uh, relative to their peers. Uh, so they have they have uh, very very um, small flows, and what's happening is they can't build venture capital fast enough because of the way the those as I mentioned early in this presentation, those investors are used to low beta. Grow, uh, uh, low beta, low growth stocks, dividend stocks, and this is completely the opposite. Case in point is Grab. Grab was formed in um, in Malaysia about 10 years ago, and the investors in Malaysia, the private equity funds, the, the funds you see that made with these real estate investments, did not give Grab the the funding it took to grow. Grab then moved to Singapore, then launched, <clears throat> merged into a SPAC in the USA. A Grab IPO at 40 billion. This was a a, a major um, own goal for the uh, Malaysian venture capital area. There are two more companies which are likely to be um, unicorns. You see, Carsom's one of those. You see the direct attractiveness of Carsom in terms of minority investors, and um, Aerodyne's another one of those. But uh, and so Malaysia has learned its lesson and now are finding capital locally, although they're still getting capital from external. Uh, investors. The other thing that's new finally in 2022 is digital banking. Um, Malaysia has um, has authorized a, um, a, a number of digital banks. Half of those are controlled by Malaysian uh, syndicates. Half of those are controlled by non-Malaysian syndicates, and um, they are attracting investment mostly from Asia and from the and from you know other countries you see here. Uh, again, um, and, and none from the UK. So, uh, and why would they be attractive? Because basically, um, this is a new area. There, there are a lot of Asian investors in these already, and most investors that are sophisticated in private in venture capital fully realize the competitive nature of Vietnam, competitive nature of Hong Kong, Singapore, um, Indonesia, and it's very difficult. And even Philippines, it's difficult to win venture capital deals. With such uh, high levels of competition, where Malaysia doesn't have that for the time being, and so they're attracting, you know, Hong Kong, Hong Kong investment, uh, or rather Singapore investment into these fund, into these new digital banks. Just uh, as, and this is a this is a change because basically, there's been very little fintech and very little movement among the big uh, Malaysian banks. They haven't really given up any market share, and and to date, not many people will take them. There's a series of small joint ventures. With China and others and the big banks, but they think they've made no real impact. Hence, hence the launch of the digital banking. So, they're trying to address uh, the government's trying to address, uh, address attracting uh, cap venture capital through the digital banking. I understand also they've recent recently reached out to Y Combinator, which is a U.S. U.S. Um, venture capital firm, a seed capital firm, to, to try and grow this. But there is a hole in. Uh, on a relative basis, which is why we didn't reduce it to write anyone to talk about it. Next page, please. Uh, this, we found this really quite, as this is more of a summation of what we, you saw on the previous pages. But again, you look, at, look at the balance of how, how the, man, you can say whatever you want about the government. I don't talk about that. I'm not really interested in that. I'm talking about what's, what's it attracting. And you can see, whether it's semiconductors, USA, EU, um, to any batteries, 5G. Um, and by the way, Huawei lost to Ericsson. They thought they had this locked up after 10 years of having this locked up. They lost it. Uh, USA, you see, won both data centers and cloud computing. Um, so, uh, China has won a biofuel, bi biodiesel biofuel and, and regional logistics. But I want to go back to the algae to energy to show 
historically, as you probably realize, Japan is a leading investor um, and into China, and sorry, into Malaysia. And what I find interesting about this, Japan currently has 35 companies, including the big three, the Honda, Mitsui Chemicals, and Enios and Energy, all looking at ways of how to convert algae into energy. This is a huge commitment. And while there are other investors like China or other players uh, that we're talking about here, um, J Japan is leading, leading, leading this in terms of taking uh, ownership of how to, to convert this and how to make this work. To show you where they are, there, I've seen numbers that said this is a 200 billion industry by 2030. So, China, so Malaysia wants to be a leading player. And the, as you all know from Malaysia, it's not a bad place to grow algae, but the weather, and also with solar, where they've been slow to, sol, uh, to launch solar. They've recently uh, um, uh, uh, authorized a, a gig of solar, and, and they're one of the first players in Asia for uh, floating solar. So they're moving quickly, as we said when we started. And more importantly, for all the criticism that they've had about too much closeness to China, it is not true because they're the numbers in his 21-22. Now, next slide, please. I'm sorry, there's so much on this slide. I apologize, but I, I needed to put it in here. Um, I don't think people have a real appreciation of how much investment Malaysia has made into the UK. Now, this is over 20 years, but it, it's really been focused in the last 10 years, and it's really focused on two major infrastructure plays, the Battersea Power Station, which you know about, and Bristol, which you probably don't know about with all the things that are going on in Bristol. So but it also goes across real estate, offshore and onshore wind, casinos, hotels, They've been a, a big friend of the UK government and loads of investment across these industries. So much so, again, that two of our leading infrastructure projects for the country, one in London and one in, in uh, Bristol, uh, are, are being led by Malaysian investors. And the, I, I find the Bristol one quite interesting. We have people that work with us living in Bristol, so I, I get to go down there. Um, and I, I think if you look at this, when they first chose Wessex Water, they've now built a spinoff of Wessex Water in, into uh, renewable energy and echo and echo energy. Um, the, the shuttle buses in Bristol are run by human waste, basically. Um, they're taking, they're rebuilding the where, the area where uh, Concord was built um, for years and turning that into the third largest. Uh, arena in the country of 17,000 seats. They're building um, um, smart housing in the area of uh, around 8,500 people now. Uh, 50, I see there's like that. There's a couple of different numbers in there. But the point is, they're, they're major players in helping develop the Fantasy Power Station, which has been huge over 40 years after after sitting uh, empty for 40 years, and developing the entire Bristol area, which is an important part of the country. So. This is what they've done to us. What I didn't put in here is what we've done with them. Over the last 10 years, the, the UK companies, not the government, companies in the UK have sold out, uh, Tesco has sold out of both Malaysia and um, uh, Thailand for 10 billion and re removed the cash. Um, BP has sold out its consumer. Uh, business in the region and also let, remove the jobs and remove the cash. And you also saw recently that um, Dyson has moved from manufacturing in Malaysia into manufacturing in Singapore, which is always the case with whether it's venture capital or or whatever, there's competition with Singapore. So when we didn't put this page in here, it's a, quite an interesting thing that to I just wanted to highlight as I'm presenting this at the House of Lords tonight of how the world has found Malaysia in the last two years, USA, EU, India, Taiwan, uh, Asia, less so uh, the Gulf, GCC, and not a single investment from any UK major company. So I wanted to highlight that because I think it's worth, it's, it's worth seeing. Because remember, this goes back 60 years, the relationship between Malaysia and the UK, if you go back, but when it's BP, uh, there have been, I guess, two small investments, one by um, 
one by to at a new office by Arup, and there was also um, capital contributed by um, AstraZeneca. There have been five attempts, five small companies in the UK attempt to try and partner with Malaysian companies in fintech. There's been total revenues that we could find of all those attempts of less than five million US dollars. So not a big, not, not, I don't see no, any investment coming in of any size. Uh, again, AstraZeneca is a one-off. And I see a lot of capital being withdrawn and I see very little inter interface with, our, with our, our leadership in FinTech here and with Malaysia. So I hope this gives you some idea of a snapshot of, of how things can move. I, I know many of you have a different history with Malaysia than I do. I've been going since 1985, I'm sure. Many of you have been going longer than 1985, but uh, the last couple of years have been quite interesting to me as the world wakes up, in particular the GCC wakes up and starts using that firepower that they have. I mean, just to give you some idea, this year Aramco will earn after tax 160 billion, one company, and the the so the, the PIF is sitting on 450 billion from prior years they could put to work. And and again, this is one component of it, but you'll see even more so when we get into the Indonesia. I think I'm over my 20 minutes, Mike, so I have to finish it up. But you want to go to the last page? That's I always finish with this because I I love I believe in these things. So it really is one people, one planet. And I really do believe the most important things that I, I can do are around health and around a green world. Thank you very much. Mike, over to you. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much indeed, Henry, for again um, a really insightful uh, look at what's really going on um, in um, a, a, an economy that many of us, as you've demonstrated, um, don't pay enough attention to um, from the UK. Um, so it's time for questions. Please do um, put your questions into um, into the system, and we'll take them. We've got the first first question from Hugh Purser, who just is asking about the Bumaputra minimum shareholding requirements. Um, and whether you think there's any chance of uh, change on those with um, new political dispensation in Malaysia. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is a kind of minimum shareholding requirement for a particular um, part of the population um, where um, they, they have, each company has to have a minimum shareholding uh, drawn from that sector of the population. Henry, any thoughts on those? I really not. I really not. Want, I really don't want to go into specifics on 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 laws, laws or regulations. It's more it's more of a high level to show capital flows between the country, companies, the countries. Um, let's just say old habits die hard. It's tough to move some of these places. I think is a way to answer your question. But I think, I, I think that, well, there is. There's also. I didn't also go into capital markets. So this addresses the capital markets issue. There is a capital markets problem, and the, the problem starts with venture capital. There's not enough capital coming into the company, country. Number two. They, they're cherry. The world is cherry picking those venture, those private equity deals, right before they get to capital markets. So the the Bursa Malaysia is actually a leader in in Islamic finance. Yes, and also palm oil, as you would know. Um, but there's not enough flow into that. So I think what you're looking at is my interpretation of of some of these moves are domestic players are beginning to put much more more attention to converting to new world. In fact, Tanaga I think is one of the first unicorns to actually go public probably next year and they'll, they'll therefore have to moder moderate what you're just talking about to attract foreign foreign capital but you're right the capital markets have constraints uh, and it goes all the way down to the venture capital area all the way through the versa Italia, uh, versa malaysia area all of which need attention yes and you're 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 just asking for what you're just addressing one piece of it right? I think it's most important is to build, like you just had, you, the, for those of you who weren't part of it, this, uh, Mike and his team just had Busan around on their, and their tech, their tech people around last week. And they've come up with the concept of putting six different venture capital funds together to build a, a base fund. Bangladesh has done something similar, which we talked about earlier with you this year. I've suggested that the Malaysian government think about something like that with uh, multiple players to help build that as a start. But still has to work as well. That stock exchange has not been, is, has been underperforming for, for some time. This is just one piece of it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Clive Bullen asks, so whether you've got views about 
uh, Malaysia's future. Um, you know, Japan's GDP looking quite static recently, and the whole question of slowing slowing growth. Um, do you have an idea of whether Malaysia looks as though it's on the up or um, or might be uh, moving in a particular direction? I, I would. I, I tend not to look at things that way. I tend to look at things of where, where do you want to play. I mean, I, as I just said, you know, I, we we advise some pretty smart people. I was on the phone to one someone in China this morning um, who wants to be or wants a small piece of one of those banks. Not a big piece, less than five percent of one of those new banks, because it's less competitive. It's just a matter of time before they they blossom as they have in Singapore or Hong Kong, mm-hmm. right? So I think it's more, I look at more of an, from an investment perspective rather than a corporate or um, if you're a political perspective. So I look at, at individual plays. I just, I mentioned on this phone call and this, in this webinar, I've already said there's two, three possible unicorns that have not been unicorns yet. So I, I'm sort of giving you little hints that there are investors that are actually looking at some of this stuff. And rather than saying, where's the GDP going to go? We're looking at it from a, where do the investors go? And interesting question again from Hugh Purser, just getting your views about the concept of, uh, of whether the concept of political risk in investment in the investment process is viewed very differently from a national Middle Eastern perspective versus a Western point of view. I mean, it is part of the uh, reason for the money for the, for the various flows, uh, a different view of investment risk and political risk in particular. Um, yeah, I think that uh, the last the last week has sent a real message to the world that basically the, the first ever China Arab summit took place with leaders from 21 countries. Yes, and I think I think you see a great deal more um, cooperation between the Arab world and China stroke ASEAN. We've already seen it in the last few years already with flows substantial flows committed to Indonesia converting Indonesia and, 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 and as I mentioned before. So yes, from, a, from an individual institutional point of view, I can see that because as you see, it took a while to settle down yet again, another election in Malaysia. And who knows where that also be settles, right? Because it'll take a while to settle. But I think if you look at it from a, you know, a, a, you know uh, or Mastar or PIF, I mean, these are long-term plays with uh, with Islamic countries, and they're going to put their capital to work with people who understand the culture. I think it's more of a cultural play and a long-term strategic play, but that doesn't mean that they're not making money out of it. Yes, yeah, I think that you know, I, I don't see them doing anything stupid. I mean, if anyone has on this, so if anyone has not worked with PIF yet, I suggest you learn how difficult it is to get something done in Saudi. The PIF before you make a decision that they're not serious about making money out of stuff. Um, we've got a, a, a note from uh, Mr. Kong. Um, Grab is a Malaysian startup. Obviously, it decided to set up its HQ in Singapore. Um, do, do you have a view as to whether you know, Singapore is a better place to invest um, than Malaysia, or you know, <laughs> what are the factors? It's, that, that it's, determine it's that? very competitive. I mean, Singapore is very competitive, right? It's it's heavily it's overbanked, overinvested. I mean, there's there's a lot of competition, and I tend to I tend to avoid where where there's you know. And I do think that longer we haven't talked longer term. This is all you know. I've designed this to be quite granular. 21, 22, maybe 23. I mean, longer term, a longer term. Uh, they have agreed finally after recutting it three times that r- railway. But Bulk Coast Railway that goes all the way up to Kunming, that's been agreed. And I think finally I've heard that there's a railway connecting finally uh, uh, Malaysia with Singapore, which has been discussed for at least two decades, right? So longer term, I think there's a real play anywhere logistics play all along that railway, all along all along all along the CN area, at, which is why Alibaba took that bet on logistics with the Malaysian Arab. It's, they, t- they chose Malaysia as a long-term logistics hub. So there's so many different ways to play this, but I tend to look at it of how this architecture gets pl- built out. Yes, and how it all gets, it's taken years to get settled, but it won't be long, 23, 24, before you're four hours between Kunming and Bangkok. And by 27, 28, you're 10 hours between Kunming and KL. 
and that's not very long from KL to Singapore, right? So it depends on your holding structure. I mean, uh, when do you want to play? And how short do you want to play? I mean, Singapore also is a you know is a panacea. Singapore came up with this uh, this way where they're going to jump the queue with with SPACs with uh, with Hong Kong. That lasted about two months. It didn't really work. So so there's no no such thing as a given in Singapore. Although Singapore is a huge, and that's why I just made the point about Grab, poor Grab that was built for Malaysia that, that built you know a, a five million company suddenly it's forty billion, and uh, that was funded really through through the Singapore government, and their and their links around uh, the the Asia investment the, the global investment community. Again, I I tend to look. I'd like to. There's an old phrase: hit them where they ain't. I, I kind of like that. Not where they are. Um, just a question from uh, Sifun Hu um, about how prospective investors might view, you know, the political position um, in Malaysia. Um, there is some evidence of growing racial and religious divides, um, and whether that has an impact on you know, investment flows. Well, it's a good question uh, because I think be, what's being asked is either either retail or institutional. What I'm talking about is global players. Which you're basically saying with all those flows, if you look at 2020, or you look at 2018, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, you don't see those global flows. In the last two years, including this year, post election, it's still flowing at, at, the, at the rates it's seen in the last 18 months. So obviously, there are bigger things here. I'm not sure many people in this country really pay attention to how the world has moved by, by the GCC players. And how they want to use that capital, which they consider to be cultures which are like theirs. I just think people are still looking at this from Western lens, which is fine, but the world has moved, in my opinion. Thank you for thank you for all of that. Um, and I guess I, 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 I'm presuming that this move, um, you know, in terms of the sectors where investment is taking place, you, you think is 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 now the trend. Um, that you know, tech and you know, moving into renewable energy and so on is is, is going to continue to be the trend for investment. Uh, but yes, I I think the play. If I'm a, if I'm an institutional investor, I get close to Tanaga, or any of those those, those old line um, energy firms, which realize they have to convert, and they're going to start using that Bursa Malaysia. They're going to bring they're going to bring that that uh, Bursa Malaysia to life. So there's an institutional play in there. Bit early, but there's an institutional play in there in the next couple of years. Yes, being driven by outside forces because you see, uh, Tanaga has also been an investor in UK offshore, onshore, as well as local. You've seen that YTL even here is building using Wessex Water to build an echo play. So, I mean, good news travels quickly, Mike. A lot of people understand how there's a lot of money pouring into the, uh, you know, here we just announced, uh, Mastar just announced. The, the largest investment in UK um, uh, energy storage from the UAE, not from China. Yes. So, uh, and, and yes. So I, I see people how, how they make these moves where they can see this coming and it's being driven really by, by energy and also digitization or semiconductors. I mean, Intel wouldn't spend 8 billion in Malaysia if they weren't serious about it. Yeah, and and you know, last year we did a piece of work with Lab One International Business Finance Centre on you know the role of digital finance in uh, opening up the Malaysian economy, um, and particularly reaching you know unbanked, non-service parts of the population. So you know, they are very serious about um, you know digitalisation across sectors, but including fintech and um, you know and insur insurance um, as a way of developing uh, their financial systems more generally. They were um, one of the first to they were one of the first to do, as you know, the blockchain. For a stock exchange, and they are now known as a world leader in captives for the insurance world. So yes, they 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 got it, but they've been slow to move, but they're moving expeditiously now. Although probably not as expeditiously as others would like. Certainly not as fast as uh, Uzbekistan, but that's a story for another day. Well, I'm sure we'll come back to uh, discuss um, various developments that are happening across the sands um, on, uh, on another occasion, Henry. Um, we've kind of reaching the end of the session. Um, and so um, my role is really to offer, first of all, some thanks 
Um, to Henry, I'll come back to you in a minute, Henry. Um, to our sponsors, uh, who I mentioned before, we really are grateful for their support, which enables us to, um, to run a series of events which uh, continue to offer uh, new insights into um, what's going on across the world. Um, and to just remind you, we have um, future events coming up over the next few days. Um, uh, tomorrow, um, talking about cash um, and the future of cash um, uh, in terms of it's not the horse cart of payments, it's the public bicycle. Um, about the measurement of corporate culture next week on Monday um, and um, looking also in the new year into uh, an update on U EU financial services legislation and cracking down on greenwashing. Um, so some fascinating things coming up um, and you know, both this side and the other side of uh, uh, seasonal celebrations. Um, so do keep an eye on the website and uh, look out for those. Um, so just to say thank you for attending uh, uh, this session. Uh, it's always good to see uh, people engaged uh, with, with, with the world. Um, and our really a huge thanks to, to Henry for once again sharing his insights um, and the, um, the outcome of really quite intense research into what's going on uh, in Asia in terms of uh, investment flows. Um, Henry, it's always a pleasure. Um, thank you very much. Um, and as usual, a very small round of webinar applause um, since I can't throw it open to the floor uh, using this technology. <laughs> thanks. thanks so much, Mike. Thanks to all for your time. Thank you very bye. much. Bye. We'll see you again. bye. Yeah, bye.